Road dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18-Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, you got your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. Stories and content in weird darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show, and while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more. This is a Weekend Archive episode of Weird Darkness with stories from February of 2016, and apparently, way back then, I was trying to make my voice a bit… scarier. So it's going to sound strange to you, I'm sure. (laughs) Now, Whether or not it's better or worse than what you've been hearing in previous episodes, I'll leave that up to you. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. When I was a child in Oklahoma, I lived in a two-story cement house, top to bottom all cement. I lived in that place for eight years of my young life, but nothing could prepare me for the ghosts that dwelled there. In the early 19th century, it was used for a sort of prison or mental hospital. This story takes place when I was eight years old. One night, my mother and stepfather were at work, and it was just me and my baby brother. It was about two in the morning when my brother came running into my room, screaming, saying someone was calling him. I told him that I would go with him back to his bed and stay with him. I had this thing I would do with him. I told him that if he surrounded his bed with his stuffed animals, they would protect him. So that is what we did this night. And then I laid down with him. I was almost asleep when we both heard what sounded like knocking on the closed door that led to a shower room of sorts. He started to cry. Then there was a banging and grunting and a hissing sound coming from the door. Everything was happening at once. We were scared but couldn't move. Unbeknownst to us, our father came home early. I heard the front door open and close. Suddenly, all the sounds in the room stopped. So I told my brother I would go get Dad and told him not to move. I ran up the stairs to the door. I didn't get to it in time before hearing my name called in an angry tone of voice. I hid behind the door, but then it swung open and my stepdad told me to go back to bed and not to get up. So I moved from around the door, told him okay, but then a look of horror crossed his face as he picked me up and ran down the stairs and scooped up my brother with me. We all were out of the house and in the car and heading to my mom's work in a matter of seconds. We waited at her work for six hours. My brother and I were tired and had fallen asleep in the back seat when my mom came out of work. My stepdad and her were talking low to one another. 
the only thing I could remember wholeheartedly was when my father said, I told Emma to go back to bed, but it wasn't her because she was behind the door, not at the bottom of the stairs. When we got home, my parents wouldn't let us go to bed downstairs, and we didn't know why until later that day. The icing on the creepy cake was when we finally did go downstairs. Both of our rooms had been torn apart, and I mean everything. Stuffed animals ripped up, heads taken off and stuffing everywhere. And in my brother's room, his door was busted open like a bomb went off. And on his walls were the words, He is mine. Rural Hall, North Carolina, there was a family. I'm sure some of you have heard about the Payne family, maybe not, where on Christmas Day, the father killed all but one son, who he had sent to a local store to buy more ammunition for his gun. While he was gone, the father went on a killing spree. After he had killed the rest of his family, he walked down near a tree where he was found with a shot to his head. Well, many, many years later, the road that they lived on was called Payne Road. A lot of the local kids would drive down the old dirt road and park on a bridge that was near their house. Legend was that if you turned off your car on the bridge, it would not start back up. Well, I was one of those kids. With my three friends, we rode down the road and parked on the bridge. But we never cut our car off we were too scared that it wouldn't start back up. We then turned the car around and started to leave as we were going back up the road. To our surprise, all of a sudden, there were headlights about two feet from our bumper. They looked like the round headlights you would find on the front of an old-time truck. The driver of our car sped up, but it stuck right there on our bumper. The faster we went, the faster it went. We started to spin in the road on the dirt and gravel. Dust was flying all up around that truck. Needless to say, I was scared to death. As we got closer to the main road, the truck just disappeared. And today, the name of that road has been changed. Edwards Road. And is now paved and the house was burned to the ground. To this day, I will not drive down that road. I have heard other familiar stories and that it is haunted. Not too far away, the family is buried all together with the father. If you or someone you know struggles with depression or dark thoughts, I'd like to recommend the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered resources to help fight depression with the Seven Cups app connecting you with people who've also struggled with depression and are there to lift you up, even professional listeners there to listen at all hours of the day. If you're having dark thoughts of harming yourself or worse, there's the Suicide Prevention Lifeline that you can either call or chat online with anytime, 24-7. The folks at ifred.org are doing what they can with research and education on depression to give us the tools we need to fight against it in the days ahead. And if you feel a lack of hope in your life, Take the 30-Day Global Hope Challenge. It's absolutely free. You can do it alone or with a friend or with a group. And after 30 days, you'll have a better understanding of how to build hope in your own life and in the life of others. You can find all of this on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook Ghosts in the Machines, Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. New technology isn't just for the living anymore. When the dead want to make contact, they will use any means. Radio, TV, mobile phones, cars, you name it. 
the other side just won't be quiet, and technology can help them make their presences felt. Whether it's a last goodbye from a loved one, a warning from beyond the veil, or just making sure we know they are still there. Ghosts in the Machines tells how ghosts, demons, and the dead use our technology to communicate using true and often creepy stories from people just like you. Here is a sample from that book. I was browsing through the Reddit website late one afternoon, looking for something to catch my eye and perhaps fire up my interest. I was bored. Eventually, I came across a story about a young couple who were on their way to the movie theater when they experienced something very frightening and deeply disturbing. It involved phone calls and the paranormal. It was something like this. The man's phone rang, and as he looked down to see who was calling, he was surprised to see his girlfriend's name identified as the caller. "'Hey, are you pocket-calling me?' he asked his girlfriend, who was sitting right next to him. A brief look of puzzlement crossed his girlfriend's face. "'Can't be. I left my phone at home on the coffee table,' she said. They both peered at the phone, still ringing and still flashing her photograph and name. A number of thoughts inevitably passed through their minds before he picked up. "'Hello?' he said. On the end of the line, he could hear rhythmic breathing. "'Hello? Who the hell is that?' he asked. The person on the other end of the line, rasping, breathing continued, but not a word was uttered. Look, who is that? he demanded. Still, there was no answer, and then a click as the other side hung up. He could feel the hairs on the back of his neck standing to attention at the idea that either someone had broken into their home, or perhaps even worse. Maybe we should go on home, he said to his girlfriend. As he turned the car around, the phone began to ring again. A glance at the phone showed it was his girlfriend's phone. He picked it up and answered it. Who the hell is this? He yelled down the phone, his heart beating madly as he did so. His girlfriend peered across at him anxiously. There it was again, a raspy, breathing sound. He listened to it for a while before screaming once more, Answer me! Who is it? They drove home silently. Each of them was afraid of what they might find in their apartment. The phone rang once more on the drive home. This time, when he asked who it was, he could hear a clicking sound as well as the raspy breathing. He was sick to his stomach with fear and apprehension. Finally, they arrived at their apartment and parked across the street. The place looked fine. "'I'm going to run in screaming,' he said. If I'm not back in five minutes, call the police. As he made his way across the street, he was rather hoping it was a break-in. But if it was, what would he do if he found someone there? And if there wasn't a break-in, then what would that mean? He prepared himself as best as he could and then quickly unlocked the front door. He charged in, screaming at the top of his lungs. He quickly passed from room to room empty. No sign that anyone had been there at all, and certainly no sign of any break-in. He found the phone, sitting on the coffee table face down. He picked it up. It showed three outgoing calls to his phone in the last 20 minutes. They would have to move. There was no other way about it. Was it really a ghost in the machine? Ghosts in the Machines by G. Michael Vasey. Available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. It was the summer of 1906, and a young woman named Grace Brown 20 years old and a few months pregnant, was on her way to the Adirondacks region of New York to be married. 
or so she thought. She had spent the last several months living on her parents' farm, writing desperate letters to her boyfriend, Chester Gillette, begging him to marry her and make an honest woman out of her. Chester, who claimed that he loved the pretty young woman, had no urge to settle down. Although he came from a poor family, Chester was college-educated, and his uncle owned the factory where Grace had worked. He believed he was several social rungs above his lover, a young girl that he had seduced and then forgotten. He wanted to marry one of the daughters of a wealthy man in town, not a struggling factory worker and daughter of poor farmers. He pursued other women, and when Grace learned of this, she threatened to expose her pregnancy and ruin his life. But all that would be forgotten if they married. The threat seemed to have the desired effect, and Chester invited Grace on vacation to the Adirondacks. It was a sort of pre-wedding honeymoon. On July 6, they checked in to the Glenmore Inn on Big Moose Lake, using assumed names. After settling in, they rented a rowboat for a picnic on the lake. The boat was never returned, and Grace was never seen alive again. Her drowned corpse was found floating in the lake the following morning. Chester was arrested three days later. Although he claimed to be innocent, he was tried for Grace's murder, convicted, and died in the electric chair in March 1908. The trial was a media sensation, but was soon forgotten. The sad tale would have likely faded into obscurity if not for author Theodore Dreiser. For years, the writer had been searching for a crime that embodied his own personal obsessions with sex and social ambitions in America. He found the perfect material in the life and crimes of Chester Gillette. In 1925, he published his best-selling work, An American Tragedy, based on the murder. The story of the trusting young woman and her murderous social-climbing beau became a part of American culture. But then, a story of art imitating life was turned around in 1934 when an American tragedy was brought to life. On the evening of July 30, 1934, Robert Allen Edwards, a clean-cut, church-going 21-year-old with striking good looks that made him very popular with the opposite sex, took his girlfriend, a homely but outgoing 27-year-old named Frida McKechnie, for a drive. The young couple stopped by to visit Frida's seven-year-old niece and then went on to Harvey's Lake, a popular resort located about 12 miles west of wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Frida and Bobby, as everyone called him, both came from respectable families. They lived around the corner from one another in Edwardsville, Pennsylvania, and attended the same church. The young couple spent a great deal of time together, much more time, in fact, than their parents suspected. Besides the usual small-town activities like church socials, picnics, and movie dates, they passed many hours in various secluded romance spots, including the town cemetery. Despite the difference in their ages and the glaring disparity in their physical attractiveness, everyone assumed the two sweethearts would eventually get married. Bobby, though, had other ideas. Three years earlier, he had gone off to Mansfield State Teachers College, now Mansfield University, where the popular black-haired young man was elected president of the freshman class. While there, he met a talented singer and pianist, a senior named Margaret Crane. The bespectacled brunette came from a middle-class family from East Aurora, New York. Though Margaret was, by all accounts, even less attractive than Frida, Bobby was entranced with her. Margaret was flattened by his attention. No young men had been interested in her before, and she soon succumbed to her handsome lover's charms. Before long, they had started a passionate affair. With America still in the grip of the Depression, Bobby was forced to drop out of college in his junior year. He moved back home to live with his parents, 
and took a job with the Kingston Coal Company, where his father and Frida's father both worked. By then, Margaret had graduated and was working as a high school music teacher in Endicott, New York. Although separated by more than 200 miles, they kept up a steady correspondence, sending fervent, heart-sick letters back and forth. In his letters, Robert called her my dear wife and made pledges of future matrimony. Eventually, Margaret gave Robert $100 to make a down payment on a used 1931 Chevrolet, which they nicknamed the Bum. The car would be jointly owned, and Bobby would use it to travel to see her. Sometimes they would meet midway for trysts at the Plaza Hotel in Scranton. Over the next year, Robert made regular weekend trips to Margaret's family's home, where he impressed her parents as a fine young man who would be a worthwhile future son-in-law. But what Margaret and her parents didn't know was that during his time back home in Edwardsville, Bobby was still sleeping with Frida McKechnie. This affair would likely have remained a secret if not for the fact that on July 23, 1934, Frida had gone to a doctor and learned that she was four months pregnant. When she broke the news to Bobby the following day, he agreed to do the right thing and marry her. They would elope to West Virginia. The date was set for August 1st, just a week away, after Bobby received his next paycheck. Thrilled, Frida began assembling a trousseau. Many would recall later that they had never seen her so happy. On Monday night, July 30, after a dinner at the McKechnie home, Bobby and Frida went out for a drive. Even though the sun had set and a hard rain was falling, Frida, giggling with excitement over the upcoming wedding, proposed that they go for a swim at Harvey's Lake, one of their favorite trysting spots. They arrived there shortly after 9 p.m. and parked at a spot called Sandy Beach. They changed into swimsuits and waded out into the water. An hour later, Bobby left the beach alone. Early the next morning, a 15-year-old girl named Irene Cohen was canoeing on the lake with her younger brother and one of her friends when she spotted a woman's body wearing an orange bathing suit floating face down beneath the water. Terrified, she paddled over to Sandy Beach and got two lifeguards who plunged into the water and pulled the lifeless body out onto the sand. The police were summoned along with a local physician, Dr. Harry Brown, who quickly determined that the woman had not drowned. She had died from a savage blow to the back of her head with a blunt instrument. When he removed her bathing cap, clotted blood came out, and he could see a laceration on the top of her head. The murder weapon was discovered a short time later when investigators who scoured the beach found a leather-covered blackjack in the sand. By then, the victim had been identified as Frida McKechnie, whose parents had spent a sleepless night wondering why their daughter had never returned home from her drive with Bobby Edwards. Within hours, Edwards had been picked up by the police on suspicion of murder. At first, he denied that he and Frida had gone to the lake at all. He told the police that, after driving around for a little while, he had dropped Frida off in town then had gone to meet some friends whose names he could not remember. When investigators revealed that the tire tracks found at the crime scene matched the tires on his car, he sheepishly admitted that he had been lying and offered to tell what really happened. He admitted that he and Frida had, in fact, driven out to Sandy Beach. Even though it was raining and there were flashes of lightning in the sky, they decided to go swimming. After changing into their bathing suits, they went into the water and waded to the float. This was a wooden platform floating on top of metal barrels that offered swimmers a place to relax in the sun. Edwards went on, I got a notion to dive. I dove. When I came back up, my hand struck her under the chin. She fell backwards and hit her head against the float. Stunned but still conscious, she had swum out further into the water. A moment later, according to his wildly implausible account, Edwards saw her white bathing cap disappear. 
I went out for her, but couldn't find her. I went back, got in my car, and drove away. On the morning after his arrest, police officers took him out to the crime scene to get his version of the events once more. He revised his story again. This time, Edwards admitted that he had hit Frida with the blackjack, but he insisted that she was already dead when he hit her. In this version of events, he and Frida had taken a rowboat out to the float. After swimming for a little while, Frida complained of being cold. As she stepped back into the rowboat to return to shore, she suddenly collapsed. Edwards tried to revive her but was unable to find a heartbeat. Panicking, he swam back to shore and ran to his car. As he climbed in, he thought of the blackjack. It belonged to his father and he had put it in his glove box for protection, he said. He told the investigators, it occurred to me that if there was some mark on Frida's body, it might look like her death was an accident and I would be left out of it. I knew Frida was pregnant. I knew she was not allowed to swim. When I returned to the boat, she was in the same position. She had not revived. I could do nothing. I put her head on my left arm and struck her on the back of the head with the blackjack. I didn't even realize what I had done, and I carried the body out to the water up to my chest and let it drop. By this time, the investigators knew that Edwards was in a relationship with another woman and had a compelling motive to do away with Frida, who was secretly pregnant with his child. When they confronted him with all of the circumstantial evidence against him, he finally broke down. This time he revealed the truth of the murder. He choked. Frida didn't faint. She didn't fall and hurt herself. I had been thinking of doing this since she told me she was to become a mother because I wanted to marry Margaret Crane. We swam for a while. We talked about her having a baby. The water was a little over four feet deep, and when she ducked down once, she came back up with her back to me. I pulled out the blackjack quick and hit her on the back of the head. I hit her with a blackjack, and then I left her in the water. After tossing the murder weapon into the lake, Edwards got dressed and drove home. He even stopped along the way at an all-night drugstore to buy some chocolate bars for his mother. Before going to bed, he hung his swimsuit on the backyard clothesline to dry. He slept soundly that night and got up and went to work the next morning as if nothing had happened at all. No one knows which reporter first dubbed the case the American Tragedy Murder. Newspaper men from two Philadelphia papers, The Record and The Bulletin, both claimed to have dreamed it up, as did a writer for the United Press Syndicate and a reporter from the New York Times. It's not hard to imagine that all of them latched on to the idea independently since the details of this latest tragedy were strikingly similar to the case that spawned Theodore Dreiser's best-selling book and the recent film. Within days of Edward's arrest, newspapers all over the country were suggesting that the novel, or more likely the movie version of it, had provided the confessed killer with the blueprint for his crime. As is the case with just about every work of literature or mass entertainment that has been blamed for inciting a murder, there turned out to be no truth to the accusation. By all accounts, Edwards had never read the book or seen the film that was based on it. Still, the startling resemblance between the murder of Frieda McKechnie and Dreiser's fictionalized version of the Chester Gillette Grace Brown case turned the story into a national sensation. Dreiser himself saw the Edwards case as an exact duplicate of the story which I had written and wondered whether my book had produced the crime. When the New York Post offered to pay him to travel to Pennsylvania and cover the trial, he eagerly accepted. On the opening day of the trial, October 1, 1934, he was one of 50 reporters who jammed into the Luzerne County Courthouse in Wilkes Bar. The scene, he wrote, was quite a spectacle. The hundreds of spectators who pushed and shoved their way into the courtroom hoping for an exciting show were not disappointed. The questionable high point came when the district attorney read a series of Bobby's steamy love letters to Frieda McKechnie. The contents were alleged so salacious that, according to one observer, 
They made John Cleland's pornographic classic, Fanny Hill or the Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, look like a toned-down version of Little Women. By then, Edwards, whom the papers were gleefully calling the playboy of the anthracite fields, had recanted his confession and gone back to his claim that Frida had died accidentally. His testimony failed to persuade the jury, and they took only 12 hours to convict him and sentence him to death. Theodore Dreiser was unhappy with the verdict. He believed that Edwards, like the predecessor, Chester Gillette, was a victim of tremendous American social pressures. Dating back to his days as a newspaper reporter in Chicago, Dreiser had observed a certain type of crime in the United States. It was one that seemed to spring from the fact that almost every young person was possessed of an ingrowing ambition to be somebody financially and socially. This distinctly American brand of crime, according to Dreiser, included the young ambitious lover of some poorer girl who had been attractive enough to satisfy him until a more attractive girl with more money or position appeared, and he quickly discovered that he could no longer care for his first love. What produced this particular type of crime was the fact that it was not always possible to drop this first girl. What usually stood in the way was pregnancy. To support this claim, he pointed to a half dozen such murders, including the Gillette Brown case of 1906 that had served as the basis for an American tragedy. It wasn't a perfect fit, as Margaret Crane's family was not rich. She was a high school music teacher and her brother was a Baptist minister, but still, the two cases had much in common. Dreiser blamed the crimes committed by these men on American society and its craze for social and money success. He believed that Edwards was just another in a long line of such killers. Dreiser was one of hundreds of people who wrote to Governor George H. Earl in a futile attempt to win a pardon for the condemned young man. Just after midnight, on May 6, 1935, after spending hours reading his family Bible, Edwards walked calmly to the electric chair at Rockview Penitentiary in Belfont, Pennsylvania. According to one reporter, he was murmuring a prayer as the black hood was placed over his head. This American tragedy had finally come to an end. Hey, weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is Wednesday, April 7th. Yep, we're having a Weirdo Watch Party in the middle of the week! Our horror host is Vincent Grimley with Night Chills Theater, presenting the 1966 horror mess Jesse James Meets Frankenstein's Daughter. The movie starts at 7 p.m. Central Time, so it is perfect for a midweek monster movie. You're cordially invited to watch the movie with me and other weirdo family members and jump into the chat room while watching so we can comment on what is most certainly going to be an atrocious flick. Again, it's Wednesday night, April 7th, 7 p.m., with horror host Vincent Grimley presenting Jesse James Meets Frankenstein's Daughter. Find the local time for your area, watch a trailer for the movie, and watch horror hosts 24 hours a day on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Amityville Horror is one of the most documented and well-known cases of a haunted house in the history of paranormal research. The story, which was alleged to have happened to the Lutz family when they moved into a large Dutch colonial house at 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, had been the subject of a series of best-selling books and a string of movies. When George and Kathy Lutz, along with Kathy's three children, first moved into their new house in Amityville on December 18, 1975, they thought they had found their dream home. It was situated near to the school, which was very convenient for the children, and the neighbors seemed friendly enough with Kathy. That is, of course, until that dream became a living nightmare, as they started experiencing the strange paranormal occurrences which eventually drove them out of the house. Prior to the Lutz's occupation of the Amityville house, 
the residence had been the scene of a horrific murder spree. On November 13, 1974, 23-year-old Ronald DeFau shot dead his father, mother, and four young siblings. However, not being superstitious, the Lutzes still bought the house. By January 14, 1976, when the Lutzes fled the house forever, they claimed to have been terrorized for 28 days by an unspeakably evil entity. Their horrific experiences included ghostly apparitions of hooded figures, swarms of flies in the sewing room and the children's playroom, breaking window panes, spine-chilling cold alternating with suffocating heat, personality changes, nightly parades by spirit marching bands, levitations, green slime oozing down the stairs, foul odors, nausea, inexplicable scratches on Kathleen's body, objects mysteriously moving, constant disconnection of the telephone service, and even communications between the youngest, Melissa, and a devilish spirit pig by the name of Jody. But more shockingly, even the devil himself is said to have actually appeared in the house. Even visitors to the house were affected by the strange atmosphere permeating through the place. Kathy's brother Jimmy and his new bride mysteriously lost $1,500 in cash. And Father Mancuso, the local priest who gave the house his blessing, suffered a horrible bout of sickness that left him physically drained. As a result, he eventually transferred to a distant parish. He is said to have heard a voice from the unseen entity ordering him to get out when he sprinkled the house with holy water. In 1977, The Amityville Horror by J. Anson was published. The book became an instant bestseller and led to a top-grossing movie in 1979 starring James Brolin and Margot Kidder. More Amityville Horror books followed, written by different authors which gave alleged accounts of the demonic entity still following the Lutzes, even after they had fled the Amityville house. As is often the norm with cases like this, Many skeptics claimed that the Amityville haunting was just a big hoax, and they were quick to point out various discrepancies in Anson's book. Even Jerry Salfven of the Physical Research Foundation, who was contacted by George Lutz in early January 1976 about paranormal activity at the house, found the whole case rather questionable. All the evidence was subjective. Also, Father Mancuso was regarded as being a poor witness as he had visited the house only the once. It took Anson three or four months to write his book, and he worked mostly from tapes of telephone interviews. Apparently, he made only a superficial effort to verify the Lutz's account. The most significant aspect of the case is the interview that Ronald DeFau's lawyer, William Weber, gave a local radio station in 1979. He claimed that the Lutzes concocted the whole Amityville horror saga around their kitchen table whilst drinking bottles of wine. He also said that after approaching them with the idea, the Lutzes broke away from him, and so he decided to sue for his share of the book and movie royalties. But the Lutzes countersued, arguing that their experiences were genuine. Mrs. Lutz's story was later analyzed on a psychological stress evaluation. The results of the test confirmed her claims. Although it's possible that the hauntings at the Amityville residence may have actually happened, many observers have deemed the Lutz's story to be overdramatic when compared to other cases of paranormal activity. Back in 1992, my wife was driving to work near Detroit, Michigan. On an isolated road, in broad daylight, she came upon a car in front of her that was not moving. She slowed down and the car was engulfed in fog and completely disappeared right before her eyes. There was no side road or anywhere it could have gone. It vaporized completely. She cautiously drove through the area where the car had been and went to work. She was so shocked by the event it was several days before she could speak of it to anyone. To this day, she has no idea what went on 
in Detroit, Michigan. into my college days, as I made my way from the Students' Union building to my student flat on the 19th floor of a campus building, I noticed a rather suspicious-looking character who seemed to be following me around. As I entered one of the elevators in the ground floor of the building, he followed, peering sideways at me but looking away whenever I tried to catch his eye. As the elevator arrived at my door, I was hoping it was all just my imagination and that perhaps he would continue up to the top floor above me. But as I left the elevator, he followed, and as I reached the doorway into the group of six study bedrooms, shared kitchen and bath that was my home on campus, he was still right there, right behind me. Do you want something? I asked nervously. Gary... I want to talk to you, he said quietly. How do you know my name? I asked in surprise. Oh, I know a lot about you, he replied, and I must speak with you, now if possible. Reluctantly, I led him into my study bedroom, and he introduced himself as an Indonesian student. He practiced meditation, he said, and he had been asked by his guide to talk to me and help with some challenges that I was facing. I was rather incredulous, but convinced. How exactly did he know my name? Anantha and I actually became firm friends from that point forward. He really did know a lot about me for someone I had just met, and that seemed both mysterious and alluring. He tried to help me understand that I was a sensitive, and that this sensitivity meant that I was open to all the flotsam and jetsam of the astral world. He also told me that my uncontrolled reaction, pure fear, was attracting things from that realm that I was probably better off without. He started to teach me some psychic self-defense methods that were useful, but the problem was that the smallest hint of any phenomenon, I became a total wreck, and fear possessed me completely. In order to help me overcome this deep-seated fear, he suggested that it might help if I could share a controlled experience with him. Sitting me down in a comfortable position, he asked me to close my eyes and relax. Peeking out of the corner of my eye, I watched him do likewise. Suddenly, I was with him in a stone tunnel. It seemed to go on for a great distance, and as it did so, It slowly curved around so that you could not see where the tunnel went. What I could see, though, was the brightest light I have ever seen. It filled the tunnel with golden light, but its source was always just around the bend in the tunnel so that it could not actually be seen directly. The light began to fill me with laughter. It made me feel very happy happier than I had ever felt and happier than anyone has any right to feel. I began to laugh out loud, and as I did, tears of joy sprang from my closed eyes. As I laughed, an odd thing happened. My laughter seemed to become magnified thousands of times and to descend in pitch until I realized that this was not my laughter anymore, but someone or something else's laughter. The laughter permeated throughout my entire being so that everything was laughter and golden light, and I knew then that I was in the presence of God. When I finally came out of the trance that I had found myself in, Anantha was already sitting opposite with me with a smile on his face and a questioning look in his eyes. You see, he is always there for you, he explained. There is no need to be frightened. All you have to do is trust in Him. As I discovered on several occasions since then, a wonderful experience like that quickly fades just as the memory of a dream fades. At the time that it happens and shortly afterwards, it feels as if it should surely stay with you forever, but it fades just the same as consciousness returns to normality. 
and with its fading away, so too the newly found and almost grasped confidence went with it, and as Anantha left, I was ashamed to feel just as frightened as I had been before. Anantha did help me a lot, though. Through slow perseverance, he got me to a state that I could best describe as the toleration of fear. He was also someone that I could share my thoughts and experiences without fear of reproach or that look of horror as your confidant realizes that you might well be a total freak. Unfortunately, he left the college at the end of my first year, returning to Indonesia, and I never heard from him again. You've bolted the doors, locked the windows, turned off the lights, and now all you need before listening to Weird Darkness is a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee to keep those ghostly chills at bay. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com. Use the promo code WEIRD and you won't even have to pay for delivery on your first order. Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Find the link and grab a bag now for yourself at WeirdDarkness.com. A friend once told me a story about a college professor of his brother's who was a Nam veteran. He explained that in a particular part of that godforsaken country, no man would enter. Well, a few of the soldiers did, and they saw a creature there which to this day they cannot describe. The creature was about ten yards away from the patrol, and in the blink of an eye it was suddenly right in front of them then suddenly standing behind them. After they returned home, this creature showed up at the professor's home in Maryland. It would physically make marks on his body and his wife's body. He contacted an old friend from the war who lived up in Canada, and he said it had visited his family too. Apparently, all but one of the patrol have been visited by this creature. I was listening to a call-in talk show on the radio while driving in Los Angeles. The announcer came back from a break to speak with his next caller. To my surprise, it was my great aunt calling in. She would not give the announcer her name but said, for those in your listening audience who know me, they will recognize me by this song, and began to sing an old tune she used to sing to me as a child. I thought I was asleep at the wheel. She went on to say that she was in the hospital having an operation. I haven't told many people and even my family, but they were doing this surgery because they thought I had cancer. They have just found out I don't. The next day, I called my mother to tell her what I had heard on the radio. She quizzed me at length about the actual time I heard my great aunt say she did not have cancer. My mother had been at the hospital with my aunt, and at the time I heard her sing and then talk on the radio, she was still in surgery. At the time of the broadcast, the doctors had not even come out of the operating room to tell my mother that my aunt did not have cancer. Ever since that experience, I have believed in the paranormal and the great beyond. My mother's friend's family lived in a house that was in one of the oldest recorded towns in Texas. My friend's mother, who lived there, had seen a ghost of a Civil War soldier appear there several times. He would just appear and stare at her and then disappear. My mom and her friend played with a Ouija board in that house, 
and my mom said that furniture in the room started shaking and it made a lot of noise and also drawers and some pieces of furniture started coming in and out. That is all she said happened, but she was sure it was provoked by a ghost since it happened when they were playing with the Ouija board. Just over a week ago, I was lying in bed, relaxing and trying to fall asleep. I had just turned off the TV, and I was about to turn over and try to get some sleep, but my cell phone that I had turned off and put on the charger suddenly started vibrating. I decided to ignore it, but it turned on and started ringing. I didn't recognize the number at all, so I picked it up and said, hello. There was nothing but static on the other end of the phone, and then the call was ended. I tried to call it back, but it said it was out of service. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more, along with the show's Facebook group on the contact page at weirddarkness.com. And be sure to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app if you haven't already. I upload new episodes there five days a week, including Creepy Pasta Thursdays, where every week I bring a fictional story of horror, and then every weekend I dive into the archives, just like I did today, to bring back episodes from years past. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production of Marlar House Productions, copyright Weird Darkness 2021. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Romans 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And a final thought. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.